Beginning in 1775, the world will go through what is generally referred to as the Age of Revolutions. During this period, revolutionary movements will spring up all over the world, especially in the Americas and in Europe. The common theme of these revolutions is the movement away from monarchies to representative governments with a written constitution. Now, in general, this period is said to begin with the American Revolution, and it usually ends in 1848. But I think it's more accurate to end in 1865, and we'll get to why. Now, revolutions come in many forms. Uh, in general, there are three main kinds of revolutions, or three main forms of revolutions. The first is when you just change the head of state. So if you just change out the king from one king to another king, that is what the glorious revolution is. So it's that uh, is not massive changes. The second form of revolution is when you change the actual form of government. So going from a monarchy to a republic, you're changing the political system. And that is what a lot of these revolutions are. The third and the most drastic is when you're changing the economic and social systems of a country. For example, going from a monarchy to a socialist or communist government or just changing every, all, all the economic and social systems. And that is the most dramatic and those revolutions, examples like the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, they are the most radical, the most drastic. They bring the most amount of reforms, and they usually end up with the most people killed. So keep that in mind as we are looking at the revolutions that took place during this period. Now, what caused this period of massive reform and all these revolutions? There are a lot of factors, but one of the main ones was the age of enlightenment, the age of reason, or just the enlightenment as it's sometimes called. Now, this is related to the scientific revolution that we talked about before. And in general, it is a move away, uh, it's an intellectual and cultural movement away from superstition and faith to reason and science and empirical evidence. So using empirical evidence and uh, rationalism to come to conclusions. And the Enlightenment has a lot of, there are a lot of, of Enlightenment thinkers. They inspired uh, the Founding Fathers one of the main ones, or one of the key Enlightenment thinkers, is a guy named John Locke. And he will especially be prominent in American uh, political thought. One of the key ideas in the Enlightenment is in terms of politics. And according to Enlightenment thinkers, there, humans have certain natural rights. And these natural rights are not conferred by governments or even by society, they are conferred by God, nature, and by reasoning. And this will lead to a change in thoughts and a change in ideas towards liberty or freedom, individual liberty, individual freedom, the idea of progress, toleration of religion and separation of church and state, and constitutional government or governments that are ruled by a set of laws rather than by the dicta uh, dictation by some autocrat or some monarch. So this will be the age of reason, the age of enlightenment is a fundamentally important factor in 
a lot of these revolutionary movements and the thought behind them. Another reason for the age of revolution is by this period, we will have examples of free societies. So free societies, relatively free societies, uh, existed in the world. England, with the Glorious Revolution, they had a relatively free society where you were allowed to practice your religion and there were places where people are allowed to vote. Now, this is a direct threat to monarchies because if you are a king and you're in a monarchy and your citizens, your subjects, see other places where people have freedoms, obviously they're going to want those freedoms. So the example that was set by some of these societies will lead other people to want those freedoms. A third reason was an economic revolution. And this is really important to understand because demanding more rights is a byproduct of an economic revolution. In US history, all major social movements stem from an economic revolution. Because when the economy gets better, people have more money, they have more rights, they have more time, they start realizing, I deserve more. And so, like in US history, after every major economic revolution, the market revolution, not incidentally led to the very first women's movement, uh, Seneca Falls Convention, well, followed shortly after. Second Industrial Revolution will lead to the Progressive Era. Uh, the 1920s, another economic revolution, it's considered a very liberating time for women. And after World War II, the golden age of capitalism will lead to the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement. So good economies lead to people wanting more rights. Those, the reverse is also true. When the economy collapses, you generally see a decline in uh, civil rights and women's rights movements. Because when everyone's worried about how am I going to live, then those other things generally get replaced with more economic considerations. So during this period, the world is going through the industrial revolution. That means more people are getting wealthy, more people's lives are getting better. And so they want more rights. So the industrial revolution is very important to this and is related to what's called revolution of rising expectations. Now, you would think that revolutions occur when people are doing terribly. But that's actually not the case. If everyone's doing bad, then, you know, what's... Uh, everyone's doing bad. Revolutions occur when there is a long period of increasing expectations, usually when the economy is actually going up and there's rising expectations and consumerism goes up and then there is either a downturn or a big part of the population is not gaining from that good economy. Revolution arising expectations, it is sometimes called the Davies curve, the J curve, because of a guy named uh, James Davies came up with it in 1969. Well, he, yeah, he, he didn't invent it, but never mind that. But it turns out this is actually true. So he wasn't the first, he came up with the revolution rising expectations, but he isn't the first person to recognize this. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville demonstrated that the French Revolution broke out in areas where the standard of living was going up. Same will be true in the R Russian Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, and in the 1960s, when there are a bunch of urban riots in the United States, it's in areas where African-American situation was actually improving. So it is the expectation that things are going to get better and then the reality that things are not getting better and the disconnect between those two. It's why income inequality is so dangerous. And 
not just between nations, but or not just within a country, but also between nations, especially in the age of social media, where you can see uh, people's lives that are very wealthy and the majority of the population is struggling economically. So revolution of rising expectations will be a huge factor in the revolutions taking place. And most importantly, fundamentally, these revolutions will take place because this is a revolutionary era. The sheer amount of change that is taking place was mind boggling. And when there's rapid change, there is usually a backlash. So during this entire period we're talking about, the rate and pace of change is enormous. And that is a major reason why this will happen. Now, Age of Revolutions starts with the American Revolution. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the American Revolution, but there are several misconceptions. Uh, most people are completely incorrect in their thinking about the American Revolution. What most people think is completely wrong. Colonists were oppressed because they were being taxed too much. The American Revolution was about taxes. The Tea Act was a tax on tea and colonists wanted independence, all of which are incorrect. The American Revolution was not, uh, none of those things about the American Revolution is accurate. So very briefly, first and foremost, colonists were not horribly oppressed. In fact, they were the freest colonists in the world. They were part of the British Empire and they were very happy being part of the British Empire. There was problems between the two sides, obviously, but as a generalization, the colonists were very well treated and they were very happy being part of England. For about a hundred years, what's called the old colonial system, where the colonists were part of the British Empire, the British had placed trade regulations or tariffs, at the time they called them duties, on the colonists. So tariff duty, that is a tax on a good coming into or out of the colonies. It's a form of trade regulation. It is. It can be used as a tax, but it is not exactly a tax. So for a hundred years, there had been tariffs and duties put on the colonists. And they had accepted it. Obviously, they didn't exactly like them, but they accepted that England had that power and had that right to put tariffs and duties. So for about a hundred years, the system, it worked okay. There were, it wasn't perfect, but both sides agreed that things were okay. But everything will come crashing down beginning in 1763. Beginning in 1763, things will take a massive turn and that massive turn will lead to the very first shots of the American Revolution just 12 years later. Now, what caused that massive change? A war. It's called the French and Indian War. It was a war happening all over the world. It's called the Seven Years War. In North America, it's called the French and Indian War. And very important, colonists were instrumental in uh, starting the French and Indian War. George Washington actually uh, killed a French diplomat, which set off a diplomatic row. So uh, American colonists will be very important in starting the French and Indian War. They will provide the primary fighting force. So they participated in it. They wanted it. And when the British win with the Treaty of Paris, 1763, the colonists will be the primary beneficiaries of the war. So here is a picture of what North America looked like before the Treaty of Paris, 1763, that ended the French and Indian War. England controls, or England's in red, France is in blue. There was a disputed territory, uh, runs roughly along the Appalachian Mountains. This is before the Treaty of Paris, 1763, and 
This is after the Treaty of Paris, 1763. So France is wiped off the continent. Spain got everything up to the Mississippi River. So the colonists were the primary beneficiaries of this war. So they participated in it. In it they wanted it. And it is, uh, it is incorrect to say that the colonists were being oppressed. But this war will lead to the changes that take place between the two sides. And there were a lot of factors. There were a lot of issues about the changes. But what it will fundamentally come down to is a power struggle. And this sounds like a bit of an over, oversimplification, but it is a power struggle. Taxes are just one of the most important powers of any government. So taxes are important, but they are not the cause of the American Revolution. Uh, think of it this way. All relationships, there is always a power dynamic to them. And so... If you have a significant other, sit your significant other down and say, hey, we need to talk, you and me. Look them dead in the eye and ask them, who has the power in our relationship? After that point, your relationship is going to last about 15 minutes. Because once you put the power dynamic into a relationship, and people start thinking about it like that. Everything goes to hell very quickly. And that is what will happen between the British and the colonists. They, colonists had taxed themselves. They always accepted England could put duties or tariffs on them, but they had always taxed themselves. And that system will be changed. Now in England's mind, it was justified. Due to the French and Indian War, their debt had doubled. So England's debt had doubled. Wars are the one of the most expensive things that humans can engage in. Remember that. That's so important to know. War is one of the most expensive of all human endeavors. And because of the French and Indian War, that again, the colonists wanted, participated in, helped start, and benefited from, the British debt doubled. And so England was taxing its citizens at very high rates. Well, in the logic of the people of England, because the colonists were part of the British Empire, they called themselves Englishmen. Again, they were active participants and beneficiaries of the French and Indian War. And the people in England were being taxed at very high rates. British logic was, so the colonists should help pay for this. And they will do this with the very first time they will put a direct internal tax on the colonists. It's called the Stamp Act. Again, they had tons of duties or tariffs that had been put on the colonists, but they had never actually put a direct internal tax on the colonists. And that is what the Stamp Act was. That is why Stamp Act is the critical point in changing the relationship between the colonists and England. The Stamp Act said every piece of paper has to have a stamp on a stamp on it. And so that includes like deeds, wills, marriage certificates, death certificates, anyone that's doing any trading. It includes newspapers and playing cards. So Stamp Act, it cannot be avoided. Everyone's going to have to pay for this in some way, shape or form. That's, that's what makes it different from tariffs. Tariffs and duties, those are taxes placed on specific items being traded. The Stamp Act is a tax in that it is imposed on everyone and you cannot avoid it no matter what. And it is only have, it only has one purpose and that is to raise revenue or raise money for the government. Tariffs and duties, that's to write, can be used to raise money, but it's also used to regulate trade. So this is the very first time the British ever tried to tax the colonists and the colonists went nuts. They went absolutely crazy, especially in Boston. Uh, Boston, Massachusetts, leading up to the American Revolution, it is the epicenter of the craziest people. It is what South Carolina is leading up to the Civil War and what Florida is today. 
Just kidding. When this passed, the people of all the colonies went absolutely crazy. They were ab furious. They were so mad that they called a Stamp Act Congress. So they will boycott British goods. They will call a Stamp Act Congress where representatives from all the colonies got together and they will come up with the immortal words. We give all due subordination to Parliament, but we do not accept taxation without representation because colonists did not have representation in Congress, in Parliament. They said, you cannot put a tax on us. Again, colonists had been taxing themselves for this entire period. So this British had never actually put a direct tax on them, but the British never said you are allowed to tax yourself. Colonists all throughout the world were taxed by the mother country. So again, the colonists in America were the freest colonists anywhere, but England is the one that changed the system. And if you have hundred years of precedence of doing something, obviously you think it's my right to tax myself and the colonists. So it's very understandable why they assumed that they had the right, even though England never actually said you have this right. So when the Stamp Act caused such hell in America, the British were actually caught off guard. They didn't expect the colonists to go so crazy. But the colonists raised so much hell that the British will repeal the Stamp Act before any colonist ever paid anything. So that's how we know the American Revolution was not actually about taxes. There's only one tax ever placed on the colonists by the British, and it is the Stamp Act, and it's repealed before anyone ever pays anything. That's how we can say with certainty the American Revolution is not actually about taxes. So why exactly is the Stamp Act so important then? Because it is. It is the defining moment of the relationship between the colonists and England, and it's because of what England did when they repealed it. When they repealed it, they also passed what's called the Declaratory Act. The Declaratory Act, these, they stated, England stated, we govern you in all cases whatsoever. So they're repealing it, but what they're telling the colonists is, yeah, we're taking this away, but we can do this if we want to. We have the right to tax you. So now we have the power struggle. Colonists say you cannot tax us because we don't have representation. The British say we govern you in all cases whatsoever. So although taxes, the tax is gone, the issue of who has the power is now there. And that will dominate everything after the repeal of the Stamp Act. You can only understand it as a power struggle because struggle, a lot of it doesn't make any sense. Like, for example, the Tea Act. It's very common to hear the Tea Act was a tax on tea, and that is just factually incorrect. The Tea Act was passed by Parliament to help the British East India Trading Company, the joint stock company. British East India Trading Company, its primary asset was tea. It was the biggest seller of tea into the colonies. The British East India Trading Company was hurting economically, so the Tea Act, all it did was say the British East India Trading Company didn't have to pay the tariffs to trade in the colonies, which would have made tea cheaper for colonists. So the number one provider of tea into the colonies is going to be able to sell it cheaper, which means tea is going to be cheaper for the colonies. The idea was this will be good for the colonists because they'll have to pay less for, for tea and they love their tea. And it will be good for the British East India Trading Company because it will mean they will be able to, able to trade more tea. But the colonists just went nuts. And there were a lot of reasons they went nuts. Uh, Boston especially, they went crazy because Boston. A lot of the leaders of the uh, people that were against the Tea Act, they were actually 
their careers, like John Hancock, the guy who wrote really big on the Declaration of Independence, his job was to illegally smuggle tea into America. So this is just going to hurt him economically. That's why uh, it's true of a lot of a lot of the or several of the leaders of the revolutionary movement in Boston, in Massachusetts. So the Tea Act, it was going to make tea cheaper, but the colonists, they completely rejected it, which, as we all know, led to the Boston Tea Party, where a bunch of Bostonians will dress, dress up like Native Americans, board a British East India Trading Company ship, and dump the tea overboard. Now, this seems like, oh, this is quirky fun. Uh, they destroyed millions and millions of dollars of, uh, of tea. So the amount that they destroyed was a fortune. It was so much that it led to England saying, all right, we've had enough. We were trying to give you tea cheaper. You went and destroyed the private property of a corporate of our major corporation, which even back then corporations had a lot of power in the government. So because of this, it will lead the British to pass what are called the coercive or intolerable acts. Coercive or intolerable acts, it's called the coercive acts. The colonists called it the intolerable acts, and there were four of them. And very briefly, the Boston Port Act said British closed down all Boston ports. Uh, trade and commerce was a major source of revenue for the people of Boston. So the British stationed ships outside of Boston and said, this port is now closed until you pay us back. So obviously it's going to hurt the economy a lot, which it did. Uh, the Boston Port Act was the British saying that we are not going to allow you to do any trade until you pay the British East India Trading Company back for what you destroyed. There were a lot of other colonies that thought the people of Boston were crazy, especially in the South. The Southern, United, or Southern colonies were fit better in with the old colonial system. They were much more happy to be part of the British Empire. They were also the ones that did not want revolution as much as people in the North. So the Boston Port Act, obviously, that did not particularly upset a lot of Southerners nearly as much as it did the people of Boston. An act for the impartial administration of justice is saying that no British officers or soldiers are going to be tried in the colonies. And the argument was the Brit uh, they could not get a fair trial in the colonies because colonists were so anti-British. And... If this seems totally irrational, uh, there's absolutely no way the United States would ever let any of our soldiers ever be tried in Iraq and Afghanistan during those wars. Uh, so it should not seem too unsurprising from the British perspective. Quartering Act saying colonies need to figure out a place to quarter soldiers. This is the one that people think was the biggest one. And it actually was not. It actually was not nearly as controversial. Uh, I think it's because people assume like, well, I wouldn't want a soldier living with me. Um, and so they're able to think about it on a personal level. But this actually was not that controversial. It's the fourth one, the Massachusetts Government Act. Massachusetts Government Act. This said the Massachusetts government was disbanded and was now going to be uh, completely appointed by the king and crown. This is the one that united all the colonists in defense of Massachusetts. This is the one that everyone in every colony had an opinion about. And it, this is the one that united the colonies because they're taking away the power of self-government. Massachusetts had had that since the very beginning of its origin. Since the very first colonies in America, Virginia and Massachusetts, they had had self-government and the British is taking that away. This is the one that made all the Southern colonies say, wait, 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 you think that you have the right and the power to take away our right of self-government. 
If England thinks it can do this with Massachusetts, that means England thinks it has this power to do that to any of the colonists, which no colonists, not no, which the majority of colonists would not accept. This was the breaking point for all the colonies. This is what will bring all the colonies together to the First Continental Congress. Very importantly, the First Continental Congress will get together and they will plead with uh, they will plead with the government in England, please, we do not want to be independent. Just go back to the way things were in 1763. 1763 is when things changed. And so they will ask the British to go back to the way things were in 1763 because they did not want to be independent. They will send a letter saying, please go back to 1763. We don't want independence. So... Colonists were not desperate for independence. They did not want independence, but King George was, uh, there, there were, in England, there was division. There were some people that thought the colonists were right. There's some people in the British government that th thought the colonists were right. But there were a lot of people that thought the British needed to have a tough hand because they couldn't let the colonists get away with this. Otherwise, they're setting an example, setting a precedent that other colonies might follow. And King George was the most adamant about not allowing, not giving an inch. So when he got the news about the First Continental Congress, said the New England governments are in a state of rebellion, blows must decide, and blows did decide at Lexington and Concord. That's why at Concord, British soldiers will meet up with a bunch of colonial, they're called Minutemen, because they would come out in a minute with their rifles. To this day, we don't actually know who fired the first shot, but it's called the shot heard round the world because the shots fired at Lexington or at Concord in 1775 touch off the age of revolutions. And when this happened, this is the first shots of the American Revolution. The colonies will then call together the Second Continental Congress. And the Second Continental Congress will become the de facto government during the American Revolution. And they again plead, please do not do this. We don't want independence. We want to be part of the British Empire. And so the colonists, they don't want independence. They want to be part of England. It is England that changed the system. Now, you can argue whether that they were justified or not, but colonists did not want independence. So when you're talking about what was the cause of the American Revolution, there were all sorts of other ones. It's a much more complicated story than, than I uh, made it just now. There were a lot of motivations. The British had closed off all colonists going west of the Appalachian Mountains. It's called the Proclamation Line of 1763. Uh, that pissed off, like, for example, George Washington. He had 60,000 acres in Ohio. Um, there were all sorts of reasons. But what they all come down to is who had the power to govern. Taxes were obviously are obviously one of the most important powers of any government. But it was not the reason. It, the best description of the American Revolution was actually given by a Minuteman. It's very simple, very brief, but it summarizes the entire thing. What we meant in going for those red coats was this. We always governed ourselves and we always meant to. They didn't mean we should. That is the best ex explanation of why the American Revolution started. Who has the power to govern? The American Revolution is very interesting and very bizarre because it is a very conservative revolution. The United States is a very conservative nation. It's a fundamentally very conservative nation from its revolution, from its founding by corporations, from its revolution that was conservative and backwards looking. Colonists weren't calling for changes. They weren't calling for independence. They're calling for the 
to go back to 1763. And they said that explicitly several times. Uh, it's very unusual. Also, there, it, it was led by the wealthiest and the most elite colonists, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, James Monroe, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin. We're talking about the richest, the wealthiest, the most powerful colonists. So they're not calling for radical change. And there was not radical, the American Revolution didn't bring radical change. When you look at how much change it brought to society, it was very, very limited. Just looking at three things, Declaration of Independence, Articles of Confederation, and the state governments, it was insanely conservative. The most radical part of the American Revolution is the Declaration of Independence. There's a lot of parts to it, but the main part to focus on, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This is calling for some very radical things. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So most of governments throughout human history is a top down. Kings have divine right. Colonists are saying that's wrong. Governments drive their power from the people, which today doesn't sound like much, but it is a radical idea for the time. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke had said life, liberty, and property. Jefferson changed it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's government's primary job, protect life, protect your freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the bizarre one. There was not a nation in the world that had created a written government, a constitution, whose, well, not a constitution, that had created a written document saying that the government's job is to allow people to pursue their own happiness. And the reason Jefferson changed that one word was because property is a zero-sum game. If I have a dollar, that means you don't have that dollar. If I have land, that means you don't have that land. Happiness, that's not a zero-sum game. That's universal. Everyone can pursue happiness in their own way, however they want, and it doesn't detract from other people, no matter what anyone thinks. We can all pursue happiness in our own way, and it doesn't. that does not have to be a zero-sum game. People make it into one, but it really doesn't have to be the last part though we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that is the most radical part of the Ameri of the entire american revolution that one line all men are created equal was that true at the time uh, did jefferson really believe that his actions say no based on the fact that, the fact that he had hundreds of slaves. Uh, also, Jefferson will oppose women having the right, women, women's rights expanding. All of the founders did, most of the founders. So at the time, the idea that all men are created equal is radical. Hell, today, the idea that all men are created equal is radical. As someone born in poverty, they are they created equal as a person born into a billion dollar household? Uh, most people do today do not agree that all humans on the earth are created equal. So this is a radical concept, but this concept, obviously from the time it was written, the world has gotten better at pursuing this objective of giving more people, including women, more rights. So Declaration of Independence is incredibly radical. The first con constitution created, the Articles of Confederation, it will only last 10 years because it is a disaster of a document. It had no president, no court system, no Supreme Court, had federal government had no power to tax, 
Uh, there was federal government had no power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce, and any changes to the articles required unanimous approval. I had a colleague that used to say that the Articles of Confederation were a great government. He identified as a libertarian, and so he said this is a great government, and it's the one we should have had. I, I pointed out that he had to believe that he is smarter than James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, John Jay, and many of the other founding fathers. You have to believe you're smarter than them to believe that this one worked. Also, it didn't work. That's why it was replaced. It was a failed government. It's called a confederation. It was a failed government, didn't work. So that is why it was replaced. But the federal government didn't fundamentally change because of the American Revolution. And the state governments didn't change. State governments say it stayed almost exactly the same way. There were some minor changes. Uh, northern states will voluntarily start getting rid of slavery, but it's because they didn't have an economic need for it. Uh, there, some states will get rid of state-sponsored religions, uh, but there are no drastic changes. So the American Revolution, it was a very, very conservative revolution. It changed from a monarchy to a republic, but it is a very conservative revolution, but it touched off the age of revolutions. And as a direct consequence of the American Revolution, it will lead to the French Revolution. As a direct consequence of the American Revolution, France will break out in revolution. And I say direct consequence because the American Revolution started because England went, doubled its debt from the French and Indian War. The French will join on the side of the colonists against England, not because the French loved the colonists, but because the French hated England so much, they wanted to make England pay. But in doing so, France will go bankrupt. France actually went bankrupt supporting the American colonists during the American Revolution. And so because France, again, I cannot stress enough how expensive wars are. Uh, there's a random fun fact for you. The highest taxes have ever been in U.S. history have always been in time of war. The very first progressive income tax was during the Civil War. Um, the highest taxes have ever been in World War II, the only time we have ever gone to war in the United States and not raised taxes were Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, in Iraq, taxes were lowered twice during the, the early parts of the war, during George W.'s administration. Why? Did we learn how to fight wars without paying for them? No, it's because taxes have become a political issue instead of an economic issue. Several Treasury secretaries under Bush actually quit because of it. But uh, yeah, all, all the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that all went on the credit card. Um, and to give you an idea of how expensive it was, to keep one soldier in Iraq and Afghanistan for one year was $1 million. And those were the longest wars in U.S. history. So do the math. Wars are insanely expensive. England doubled its debt. France now went bankrupt. So, because France went bankrupt, the king at the time decided, all right, I've got to deal with this. So, he called up the parliament. Now, France had had a parliament, a parliament that had, he essentially had just said, you're not allowed to meet. So, it was not active. So, he called up the long defunct Parliament, who had, and which had very little power, because he thought he would could get them to raise taxes, so he could deal with being bankrupt. This turned out to be a major mistake, because now we brought them together. Now they are organized, and in French society, in this Parliament, there were three estates. The very top estate, that was the first estate. That is the uh, religious leaders the clergy. Second estate, that is the nobility. And 
consists of about 2% of the population. Uh, and the very bottom class, are nobles out of 2% of the population, the bottom class, though, the third estate, that is the majority of the population and the part of the population that paid most of the taxes. They had very little rights, and obviously, this did not go well. The commoners in the third estate, the workers, the peasants, the bourgeois, they decided they were going to create a more representative legislature and they were going to demand a written constitution. So they will call for the writing of a new constitution and a creation of a, a permanent representative parliament that had more powers. And so they are making very strong demands. Now the American or the French Revolution will go through it's a very general, big generalization. It goes through three phases. The very first phase, you would call the idealistic phase. And it's best represented by Marquis de Lafayette. He was actually, he actually served in the American Revolution. He was very close to George Washington. Uh, George Washington treated him like a son. And he had very grand ideas was inspired by the American Revolution to create a very democratic, classically liberal system with a constitution, with a bill of rights, with religious freedom. So he will want to create a representative government that is democratic and is going to have a lot of the features of the American Revolution. He still wanted a king. He thought the he thought the American Revolution went too far, but he will represent the very idealistic phase, which does not last very long. The problem with revolutions is once you open that floodgate, good luck closing it off and stopping it. Because once once the people, once the populace got control of it, it very quickly spiraled out of his control and out of a lot of the other uh, initial leaders of the revolution's control. It will go very fat, far, very fast. It will become the second phase, which is represented by a guy named Maximilian Robespierre, and this is the populist phase. Robespierre will seize power, and he, when he seizes power, he will denounce everyone who is not for him as a traitor. So the whole thing started as a struggle for democracy and free speech, but it will descend into radicalism, repression, and murder. So the rise of populism went along with the rise of patriotic nationalism. Those two things usually go together. Populism and hyper-patriotic nationalism will lead the, to the whole thing just going off the rails. They will overthrow the monarchy. And then in 1792... They declare, French declare a war on all monarchies. So in 1792, which countries have monarchies? All of them. So now France has declared war on all monarchies, which is the rest of Europe, which is insane. So when they declared war on all monarchies, all the monarchies declared war on them. And Austria, Prussia, Russia, England, they're all now threatening the call or threatening the French. So when this happened, then things got really radical because now you have a foreign, a threat of a foreign enemy, which they created, but you have a threat of a foreign enemy, especially the Austrians that are possibly going to come in and the radical radicalization of the French revolution escalated uncontrollably. 
Now that there is a foreign enemy, any opposition was seen as counter-revolutionary and treason. And Robespierre will lead in the opposition to anyone who was, anyone that gave any hint of being opposed to the revolution. Even if you weren't enthusiastic enough for the revolution, you were considered uh, a traitor, a counter-revolutionary, and they'd say you wanted to re-enslave the people, which will lead into the reign of terror. The reign of terror, they first chopped off the head of King Louis on the new, Louis, newly invented guillotine, and this will kick off the reign of terror, which is top-down state-sponsored program of violence. Now, there's a general perception that this was all the rich and the elite being executed, and there was, uh, there definitely was some of that, but there were more than 17,000 people executed on the guillotine, and most of them were from the working class. Anyone who was considered not a friend of the revolution or not supportive of the revolution, and it could be anything. So this period was marked by mass paranoia. Populism and paranoia do go together. And there's a, you could be accused for just about anything. Uh, there, bread makers raised their prices too high and they were accused of uh, trying to starve the revolution and so they were executed. So there will be mass purges and it's called the reign of terror because it was a terrifying period to live in. So this is top-down st state-sponsored program of violence of ordinary people. And it is the inspiration, it will be the inspiration for Vladimir Lenin, uh, Joseph Stalin, Soviet Union, uh, Mao, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, just purging anyone that is an enemy of the state. And relatedly, they will also, in 1793, call for a conscription. They will call for a conscription and they will order raising 800,000 troops. The first year alone, in 1793, 800,000 troops will join the military, join the revolutionary cause. So the entire society was geared towards the revolution. And this is one of the most uh, unique parts about the French Revolution is the mass conscription of the population, which populism and militarized nationalism go together. Militarized nationalism was not an accident of the French Revolution. It will be the heart and the soul of it. Militarized nationalism will become the epicenter of French success. And it is a very, very short step from populism, militarized nationalism, to charism, uh, charismatic authoritarian or demagogue. And that is where we get to the third phase of the revolution. Emperor Napoleon. Napoleon will come to power by offering stability. There was a lot of crisis and a lot of chaos in France. And Napoleon will come into power, say, I will be a stabilizing force. Because of that, he will be able to take power in 1799, claiming he is going to protect the revolution. He will say, the revolution is over. I am the revolution. But very quickly turned against his Republican principles, he'll crown himself emperor and give royal titles to his fam friends and family, put them in charge of entire countries. So uh, it's what you call nepotism, putting family members that are not skilled in leadership positions. So the revolutionary fervor for Republican government, it succeeded in fueling mass enthusiasm for all out war and in order, when all our war happens, obviously you need a strong central government, you need a leader, you need, need stability. And so 
it leads to dictatorships. There's a very strong correlation between dictators and war, like Vladimir Putin launching the war in Ukraine. Uh, war Dictators go to war. It's part of the way they stay in power. So France will become an empire. And under Napoleon, it did really, really well for a long time. France is up against the rest of Europe, and it will single-handedly conquer most of Europe. Over the course of 20 years, uh, Napoleon will defeat five anti-French coalitions. So five times a bunch of other nations will get together to try to defeat the French. And Napoleon was just a good military tactician. He was a good military leader. And so he will do a hell of a job in conquering most of Europe. Exception was England and Portugal because the government of Portugal actually fled to Brazil. But he conquers basically the rest of it. So he has huge military successes. But the problem was he instituted economic reforms, but they were very, very failed economic reforms. Uh, he tried to modernize France. He tried to stimulate innovation through state mandates and state patronage. So, you know, this government of France trying to pay scientists and inventors. Uh, it was a top-down form of trying to be economically innovative, which, as we saw in the Netherlands and England, it works better if it's the bottom up. And so it will not work very well. France's economy during this period, it will only be able to balance its books. It will only stay economically afloat because of military strength and plundering. That's the only way France's economy does well is by plundering other nations, not by modernizing, not by creating a modern economy and a financial system like happened in uh, the Netherlands, England, and the United States. So it's very important. In the modern age, it is much more economically worthwhile to become powerful by trade rather than military conquest. Military and conquest inevitably is insanely expensive. So France's economy was never very good during this entire period. And he will also try to shut off trade with the rest of the world. Now, remember, this is the period where globalization the country that succeeds, the countries that succeed are the ones that globalized. That's been true for hundreds of years now, going back to Venice, Spain, Portugal, Netherlands, England, and the United States. Whichever country can globalize the best, they are the ones that are able to do best economically. They are the ones that have long-term economic growth and stability. Napoleon, he was so pissed that he could not actually fight or take conquer England because England had the best navy in the world. So he enacts a continental system which says, we are not going to trade with you. So this is what you call economic protectionism. It is, it all goes along with populism. Populists very generally believe in economic protectionism, like stopping trade with other countries. And it goes against globalization and it's just bad for an economy. This was aimed at England. And so the problem was England had the best Navy in the world. It did hurt England's economy for a little while, but then England just adapted. That's why capitalism is such a good system is England then, instead of trading with Europe, it started trading more with the United States, Latin America, and Asia. So it hurt England for a little bit, but in the long term, it just made England's economy stronger because England found different markets. Capitalism, that's why it's such a, for it's all of its problems, it's the best economic system because it adapts to change. So this, in the long term, it helped England. Also, this continental system will lead to Napoleon's downfall. 
because in 1810, Russia decided we want to go back to trading with England. So Russia will go back to trading with England, which made Napoleon so mad, he will launch a disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812. And his campaign in Russia in 1812 was just an absolute disaster. And I'm not going to any details, but I'll just give you two numbers. His grand army that entered Russia had 600,000 men. When they come crawling back out, they'll have less than 25,000 people left. That's how much of a disaster the campaign in Russia was. 600,000 to less than 25,000. So this will mark the end of Napoleon's reign and the end of the French Revolution, which in 1815 will end when another King Louis was put on the throne. So why did the French Revolution fail? Well, failed for a lot of reasons, but uh, for one, it was top-down, centralized, dictatorial change. And again, as we have seen in the Netherlands and um, England, and even the United States, it wasn't leaders imposing this. The, there was, uh, there were leaders, but they weren't uh, demanding this on the population. They were able. They more like reflected the population. But under the monarchy of King Louis, under the uh, Republican governments of Robespierre and imperial nationalism of Napoleon, it's all top-down di dictation. So it's a very top-down system. And really importantly, modernization takes decades or centuries they will try to impose a modern and system and enlightenment on a population that was not ready for it. France's economy was fundamentally agricultural. Most people lived in rural areas still. It was not advanced like the Netherlands or like England or like uh, the colonists were. So it will go too far in creating a revolution from the top down and imposing massive changes on society that just was not ready for it. It's like when in Afghanistan they created gender equality until as soon as the U.S. pulled out, it went away. Imposing modernization, imposing change too fast does not go well. Dutch Revolution, English Revolution, American Revolution were bottom up. They grew naturally. There were leaders, but they grew naturally out of social, economic, technological, political changes. And they were natural and based on decades of natural change taking place. The French Revolution, it was the French leaders trying to reshape society in one foul swoop and too much change too fast does not generally end well. Humans have a natural dislike for too much change. There's a term for what was happening. It's called the law of unintended consequences. It's a problem also with when a law is passed, there are always unintended consequences. And there were so many changes in French society that it is impossible to go through all of them. Some of them were you know, are considered good. Napoleonic codes, he tried to create a new legal system with the rule of law and civil codes, civic codes, and uh, tried to create an administrative system, a government that was based on merit. So there's some things that were good. Uh, they also tried to enact enclosure. If you remember, enclosure was something that happened in England, but he's putting this on a population very quickly. In England, it took a long time for the enclosure movement to take off. It wasn't just forced immediately. And so it was insanely disruptive. One of the more bizarre ones was they actually tried to change the calendar 
changed, they tried to change time itself. The 12 months were renamed, divided into three weeks, lasting 10 days each. Each month had three weeks. There, each uh, week lasted 10 days, and there were 10 hours in every day with 100 minutes, and every minute had 100 seconds. So they're trying to literally recreate time. It's impossible to imagine how disorienting that would have been, but there was just too much change happening at once. And so the sheer scale of change and the fact that it was top down, it didn't occur naturally, meant that there was just too much instability. So that was a major, that's a core problem of the French Revolution. Also, something that's very important to know, in philosophy, there's something called the either or or black or white fallacy. This is also called the uh, false dilemma, false dichotomy, false binary. Uh, this is what most people do. The uh, people that are really extreme politically, they especially do this. If you're not on their side, you are against them. And everyone experiences this. If you don't believe exactly what I do, you are the opposite. You are really extreme. Extreme people believe everyone is either on this side or this side. And that is just not the way the world works. The world is not black and white, false uh, dichotomy. But that is what happened during the French Revolution. Revolution. There was, they tried to categorize everyone into your either a French patriot or you're a French traitor. You're either with us or against us. And that is a dangerous way to think. It's also wrong most of the time, but it's just a dangerous way to think. So French Revolution, it ultimately will fail. And there are a lot of implications for it. There's a lot of reasons the French Revolution is so important. Uh, for one, it's uh, it was explicitly the model that Lenin will call for and Stalin. So the French Revolution will be a model for other extreme revolutions that take place, or radical revolutions that take place. But in France, the repercussions of the French Revolution were very bad. In the long term, it led to political instability in France for a really long time. In fact, from 1792 to 1958, so about a, about a little over 150 years, France will be governed by three different monarchies, two different empires, five republics, one socialist commune, and one uh, quasi-fascist regi regime. So it will have no political stability, and that is never good. So it will be a very politically unstable country for a long time. In contrast, England has had no unconstitutional, unconstitutional or violent change in government since 1688. It is the longest lasting representative system of government on earth. So just to give you a comparison, and that obviously is one of the reasons, among many, that England will become the economic superpower. Also, this will destroy, French Revolution really damages the French economy. France's economy will be destroyed because of this. Because again, there was not natural economic growth. It was growth through conquest. And for, in a, for example, at the end of the French Revolution in 1815, uh, France's level of industrialization or industrial output, manufacturing output, was the same as England's had been in 1780. So it is decades behind England. That's why England will just soar while France stayed, well, France declined. Also, in terms of trade, uh, trade in France shrunk from 20% uh, of GDP, gross domestic product, till to about 10% in 1820, uh, 30 years later. So the amount of trade less or was cut in half, which again, in the era of globalization means you're not going to grow economically.
Now, also, another important legacy of the French Revolution was one of the most novel parts was mass conscription. And this will be important in the future because before this, wars had generally been fought by a small number of professional soldiers and mercenaries. So professional soldiers and mercenaries uh, would form into armies and those armies would fight each other. The French Revolution was different. It's mass conscription of all the population. It is what is often referred to as total war, which we will come back to when we talk about World War II. So there was a revolution, especially in military strategy. Another important, really important consequence of the French Revolution was during the Napoleonic Wars, France will invade Spain. It's called the Peninsular War, but it's fought in the Iberian Peninsula between Spain and Portugal, the United Kingdom versus France, but it led to so much instability there that what ultimately will happen is because of that level of instability in Europe, it will lead all the Latin American countries between about 1810 and 1820 to declare independence. So Latin America in 1800, virtually all of it is controlled by a Spanish country. And by 1830, uh, none of them are. Well, almost none of them. So it will lead to a massive, massive revolution movement in South America. So it's a direct consequence of the French Revolution. Another consequence of the French Revolution is it will ensure England's place as the global political and economic powerhouse. England had already established a very strong economy and a good navy, but because of the continental system, because England had to find other trade areas, it will become the undisputed naval, commercial, and industrial power. It will... The... French Revolution actually made England's economy better in the long run. So for England, it had a very positive effect. So England will become the globe. Uh, this French Revolution will assist in England becoming global power, and it will really accelerate England's process of industrialization and uh, commercial dominance in the world. On the continent of Europe, the French Revolution led to a conservative backlash. The revolution had been so disruptive and so all-encompassing that there will be a meeting. It's called the Congress of Vienna, where the major powers, Austria, Prussia, France, Russia, and the United Kingdom, will agree that they are going to ensure stability. And so there'll be an extended period of relative... Um, they will ensure that there is not massive revolutionary success for decades. Within this group, there was what's called the Holy Alliance. And the Holy Alliance is a coalition of Austria which was predominantly Catholic, Prussia, which pre predominantly Protestant, and Russia, which is Eastern Orthodox. And these three countries will especially work to restrain all democratic liberal movements and secularism. So these three countries will reinforce the divine rights of kings and Christian values and they will do it by force. So the French Revolution will lead to a very, a period of conservative backlash. And because it went so extreme, the French Revolution will really discredit rationalism, democracy, and even beneficial modernization. So there will be a general trend towards trying to restrain moderniz uh, modernization modernization, democracy, and also 
uh, Enlightenment thinking. So they will do a very good job of it too, for a while. Following the revolution, or following France's defeat, there will be a series of revolutions. Revolutions bust out all over the place in Europe for several decades, but they're very quickly put down. In 1820, there is a series of revolutions. Spain has one that's put down by a, a 100,000 person French force. Uh, Portugal will have one. Italy has one that's put down by Austrians. Uh, Greece will call for revolution from the Ottoman Empire. Because it was calling for revolution from the Ottomans, Greece actually gets assistance from the British, French, and Russian, and it will become an independent nation. Uh, Russia, there will be a failed coup. And then in 1830, there is more revolutions in France, the Netherlands, Netherlands, Poland, Italy, Portugal, Switzerland. You definitely don't have to memorize all these. And these will all be touched off in Europe with the revolutions of 1848. The revolutions of 1848 are called, it's called the springtime of the peoples because there will be revolutionary shockwaves all throughout continental Europe. Switzerland, Switzerland Portugal, uh, current day Romania, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Holland. It happens all over the place. And there were attempts at national independence and the creation of democratic systems and liberal reforms. In general, what united these is rising up against autocratic rule. And there was a very good reason that these took place because society had been modernizing. Even with the dictatorial rule, even the monarchy, monarchical rule, societies had been adopting some of the economic modernization. So the industrial revolution was taking place and societies were becoming economically modern, but at the same time, they were still politically repressive. So peasants, uh, society is becoming more modern. More peasants were going out of farming and moving into cities to work in manufacturing and the modern industries. And at the same time, the government was trying to suppress any political pluralism or political liberalization. It, these actually started in, this series of revolutions started in France, in Paris. Uh, government actually put a crackdown on political gatherings and the working class who were in a lot of poverty, they rose up in revolt. Now, all these revolutions that break out in 1848, in the short term, they will be failures. So in the short term, the monarchs will suppress them. And in fact, the only successful place the revolution took place uh, was actually in France. They were going to create a new democratic liberal government, uh, but the first election was won by Napoleon's nephew. And within three years, he seized power in a coup and declared himself emperor again. So it didn't go very well. So in the very short term, these were failures. But in the long term, the revolutions of 1848 will lead, for one, all of Europe to adopt more economic reforms. All of Europe will start ado adopting more of the economic modernization, such as railways, uh, increased trade and commerce and industrialization and move towards more capitalist systems. So all the countries will start adopting these newer forms of uh, newer economic trends. And as a consequence, they will also start adopting some of the political liberalization that the revolutionaries had called for. So in the short term, they were put down, but in the long term, the conservative ruling class actually started voluntarily accepting structural reforms of their governments in order to avoid revolution. Best way to avoid revolution is you make people not want to have a revolt. 
So the governments will actually start adopting countries, and this includes the monarchical countries like Russia, Austria, Germany, and they will make some liberal concessions like empower, empowering parliaments and legislatures, um, having freedom of speech, uh, ending, re, ending royal monopolies on power or ro, uh, royal absolutism. So because of the revolutions of 1848, the world will start move or Europe will start moving in a more uh, liberal direction, classically liberal direction, and will become more nationalistic. So that is, these are all important legacies of the French Revolution.